Morning, everyone. Good morning. Nice to uh, nice to be with you this morning, and thank you for the kind uh, invitation. It's also good to know that um, if it's boring this morning, then there's Veggie Tales as a backup option out the back. And now it's lovely to be here. And um, just before I get started, I'll uh, just commit our time to God and, and just ask for His help as we try to lift out a few things from his precious word. Father, we thank you for uh, the ability to, to, with great freedom, open your word and read from it. We thank you for that privilege. And we thank you that uh, this special book that you have written for our instruction um, is available for us to, to help us in life, to guide us, to correct us, and to challenge us. And we pray that you will do all those things in our hearts this morning. And that whatever is done, Father, would be to the glory and to the honour of your Son, the Lord Jesus. We ask for your help in his name. Amen. Who here has, um, has, has never been offended or upset by anything in life? Yep, I thought so. Okay, so we're, um, we're covering a subject which might be of help to you then. Um, you may have experienced even in uh, younger stages of life, I know I have, that you know, maybe a sibling has upset you, they've done something to you, annoyed you. How do you respond to that? Well, I had to share um, a room with my brother for many years, and um, we didn't see eye to eye. And I can share a lot of stories with you afterwards if you want to meet me for coffee, um, about just how I didn't exemplify Christ and um, deal with him as I should have done. Um, but that's, that's kind of the sort of stuff that we, we just take for granted, isn't it? We take, you know, kids do things and they retaliate and so on, but as we get a bit older, how does that change? Does it change? Do we progress? What about um, you're in a relationship that um, turns sour? What happens? You start posting on social media bad stuff about the person that you used to be friends with. How do you deal with that sort of stuff? What about at work? If somebody treats you unfairly, how do you respond to that? Do you, do you change your work habits? What, what goes on for you in those spaces? So what we're going to read today is actually um, really powerful stuff and, um, and really helpful. How many people have read Philemon many times? Thank you, Alistair. At least one. No, I saw another hand go up. It is, it is an amazing book, and I have a, a special fondness for it because um, when I really started getting down to Bible study, this was the first book I studied, and mainly because it was the shortest one. And so that was my reason, and because I could get through it fairly quick and sort of set up how I was going to do my studies. But I actually enjoyed it so much. It's, it's taken a special place in my heart. And so let's read this together. And it's a very interesting and a very personal letter. Very personal letter. So as we read it, we're reading something that's been written by somebody to a close friend. So Philemon, and if you're struggling to find it, it's just before that big book, Hebrews. Beth, you're on mute. I'm on mute. Yeah. That's a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> Right at the top, push that across. How's that do? Oh, that's better. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, at least, at least you can hear me read this now. Here we go. Philemon, verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co worker, to Aphia, our sister and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So just in those opening verses, Paul is setting the scene, he's introducing us to the main characters. His letter is actually to Philemon, but he acknowledges Arthia, which we believe to be his wife, and Archippus, which we understand is their son. Now he also 
introduces us to the fact that the church met in their house. In other words, they didn't have a, another building to meet. So they met in his house. So he's a prominent person in the local church and uh, obviously very generous to people to bring them in and uh, meet in his place. Verse 4, I always thank my God when I make mention of you in my prayers because I hear of your love for all the saints and the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Verse 8. For this reason, although I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right, I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. I, Paul, as an elderly man and now as a prisoner of Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my son, Onesimus. I became his father while I was in chains. Once he was useless to you, but now he is, both, he is useful both to you and to me. I am sending him back to you. I am sending my very own heart. I want to keep him with me so that in my imprisonment for the gospel he might serve me in your place. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. So that your good deed might not be out of obligation but out of your own free will. For perhaps this is why he was separated from you for a brief time, so that you might get him back permanently, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. He is especially so to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would me. And if he has wronged you in any way, or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention that you owe me even your very self. Yes, brother, may I benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, since I am confident of your obedience I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. I'm just going to leave that there for the sake of time. So there are a few things that are happening in this letter. So in, in a brief potted history, what's happened is Philemon, who had um, a servant called Onesimus, found one day that Onesimus had run away from him. And now that's not unusual in this sense that um, it was common in those days to have servants. And it was common for those servants or slaves to want their freedom. And so here's a guy, Onesimus, who decided to make a run for it and he escapes. Now it's interesting, isn't it, that he has been surrounded by Christian influence in the household of Philemon. Maybe that was part of his longing to get out of that environment, I don't know. But he doesn't want to be a slave and he makes a break for it. Now God's got a sense of humour, so he ends up alongside Paul. Now Paul doesn't spare anything and starts preaching the gospel to him. And he probably thinks now, well I can't get away from it, can I? And so as a result of him meeting Paul, God spoke to Onesimus again, and Onesimus saw the light. He accepted Jesus into his heart, and he got saved. Wonderful, isn't it? But now you see he has a problem. 
because before he didn't know what he was doing wrong in running away. But now he got saved. Now he knows that he's done wrong. What does he do? Quite likes his freedom, doesn't want to do anything to change that. But also he's got Paul on his shoulder, and Paul knows a thing or two. Paul saying to him, well, hang on. What you did wasn't right. And we're going to need to fix this. So how does he do it? Now this is interesting. And I, the first thing I want to do is highlight a couple of things that we shouldn't do in this situation. So you might have in mind a circumstance where you can relate to this. You know, something that happened that needs to be sorted out. How do you respond to that? Here's a common response that uh, people like to do in these situations. The sweep response. In other words, sweeping it under the carpet. Pretend there's nothing wrong. I, I always remember going to um, my aunt's house. It was a very old house in the south of England, made out of stone. And there wasn't much in the, in the room. But the old furniture collected dust and there was old wooden floors. It was great fun banging those chairs and seeing the dust rise. But then getting in trouble as, as uncle had to come through with the broom and sweep it. But one thing he didn't do was just lift the corner of the mat and sweep it. Pretend it didn't exist anymore. No, he got the dust pan. He dealt with it properly. Took the trash out. But you see, we often respond to these situations by trying to just do the bare minimum. Just do a little bit of a sweep, and nobody will notice we chucked it under the mat. Nothing else to see. The problem is, it doesn't go away. And the example I've given is 2 Samuel 13. Now, the situation is this. One of David's daughters, called Tamar, was wronged by her brother in a huge way. She was violated. It was horrendous what happened to her. What happened in her life changed her outlook for the rest of her days. That's how significant it was. It changed the choices that she had. It changed the future she was looking forward to as well as all those feelings of abuse and guilt that she had through this event happening. So what is going to happen next? Surely, surely something will happen to try and rectify the situation. David needs to know about this. Well, David hears about this. He heard about it all right. And the Bible even says that he was angry about it. Right, so what's David going to do? David's going to sweep it under the carpet. He's going to pretend it never happened. He's going to send his son away and just, and just pull, pull a curtain across it and, and pretend nothing happened. Do you think that dealt with it? How... How do you think Tamar felt in those circumstances when all that had happened and now her father hears about it and now this is his response? And she is left with all that guilt, with all that feeling that came to her from that experience. Everything had, had turned on its head for her existence. And now she's just left with it? How can that be right? But that's what David did. And it seemed to be okay for a little while. It seemed to go okay. Nothing really sort of ramped up. There were no repercussions. David thought, okay, well, that's, that's okay. That, that's settled down. Tamar hasn't sort of pushed for anything more. But you see, it hadn't settled down. Because Absalom, her brother, Tamar's brother, heard about this. 
and he was beside himself. More than that, he couldn't believe David's response to the situation. Just ignoring it, pretending it didn't happen. Now, his response is interesting. Now, you see, you see how we might think that just sweeping it under the carpet is okay and things settle down. But it, it starts to permeate and gets out into the wider family, doesn't it? Absalom's now involved. Others are looking on. You can't just contain it and pretend it doesn't happen. It doesn't work. And so after two years, two years, you would think that's it. It's all sorted. No. Absalom then steps in and does what he considers to be just in the situation and take, takes the life of the offender. And now we have a massive problem. And the family is going to be broken apart all because David didn't deal with the event at the, at the first instance he could have. So sweeping it under the carpet, if you're thinking of doing that, ends up doesn't work. It's only going to get worse and the problem's going to get bigger. And the outcome is going to be even greater than you might have anticipated. Here's another situation. Sometimes, sometimes we like to stamp our foot, you know, declare our authority. You know, something happens, we want to deal with it, we're really going to let people know we're in charge, they need to listen to us and do what we say. Here's an example. Rehoboam. Now, Rehoboam was Solomon's son. He was the next in line to the throne when Solomon died. So he had the right and the authority to make demands. When it came time for him to take the throne, he met with the nation of Israel, and they raised concerns, and they said to him, look, we found it really oppressive under your father's rule. We would like some, um, some of those harsh conditions removed from us. Now, Rehoboam got some advice from the senior leaders of the day, and they said, listen to them. Listen to them. Because if you respond kindly to them, they will love you all their, all of your days. But he didn't. He listened to some young guys, his peers. He said, no, nope, I'm the king. You'll do what I say. How did that go for him? The kingdom split, and he got left with two tribes, and the ten went on their own. So, sweeping under the carpet doesn't work. Stamping your foot doesn't work either. What does work? Well, Paul has given us a blueprint here. And let's, let's have a look at some of the things that he does. First of all, he begins by appreciating Philemon. Did you notice when we read through that what he does? The first thing he says to Philemon is... I appreciate the love that you have for all God's people, for your faith in Jesus Christ, the effective contribution you make to the church. And I'm encouraged, Philemon, by all the things that you do for God's people. Isn't that lovely? You know, if... If there had been some time between correspondence and Philemon was wondering, you know, why is Paul written to me, you know, are we still in good terms? You know, are things still all right with, with me and Paul? Then this would have settled him immediately. He got that letter and the first thing he reads is, oh, Paul's so thankful. I'm not sure I deserve this, but it's lovely. It's lovely to read that. He's actually praying about me and thanking God for me. He's a lovely guy, Paul. I really like him. And you can see that Philemon, his defences are down, and he's receptive to what's coming next. Anyone ever heard of a positive sandwich? Positive sandwich? A couple of nods, thank you. Positive sandwich. We've got an example here, Revelation 2, 1 to 6. Read it when you get home. Um, it's when God is giving an example here, it's really important to pay attention. So he's, he's writing to the church in Ephesus, 
And he's saying to them, this is what I enjoy about you. This is what I love about you. And then the next thing that comes is that, hang on, you've got something you've got to fix. And then right at the bottom end, he says, but well, this is also good that you do. You see that? The positive sandwich? The filling's not so nice, but you've got two bits of bread either side. And they've got to be whole milk. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so, so here's our example. So positive sandwich. So Paul is leading Philemon with some positive stuff before he gets to the meat in the middle. It's nice, isn't it? So it's, it's very instructive, very instructive. So, what does he say? The next thing he says, really, really interesting. Philippians 4 verse 5, I want to get to that. Paul says, I've got some rights here. Now, this might seem to contradict what we were saying before, but bear with us, we're, we're just trying to understand what's, what Paul is doing as he's travelling through this. He is, he's saying, you know me, Philemon, you know the position that God has given me and the responsibility I have. I have the right to command because that's the position God has given me. That's, that's my, my right. But I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. So why does Paul even mention that he's going to do that? He's got that right. Why does he even mention that? Because Paul is concerned that things are dealt with in good Christian character, not because of position or authority or anything else. He's saying it's not important who I am or the position that I have. I want you, Philemon, to see the Christian character expected in this situation. Now, Philippians 4, verse 5 says this, Let your moderation be known to all men. Let your moderation. Another translation would put it, your sweet reasonableness. Sweet reasonableness. Interesting expression, isn't it? The, a really good example of this is in Genesis 13. You remember how um, Abraham had received the promise from God? You know, he, and God has said to Abraham, All of this land I'm giving to you, and I'm going to make a great nation out of you, and it all belongs to your descendants. Okay. And then Lot's here as his nephew. And after a while, they both became quite rich and had lots of possessions. And there was lots of niggling between the herdsmen of, of both of these important people. And so Abraham, Abraham takes Lot aside. And he says to him, Lot, it's not good. It's not good that we're occupying the same spaces, causing friction. Now, I'll tell you what we'll do. Because you tell me which way you want to go, and I'll go the other way, and then we'll get in the space we both need, and we'll both be happy. And there won't be any more of this friction. Well, Lot's quite pleased with that, of course, isn't he? So Lot looks around, and he assesses the situation, and he thinks, ah, yeah, so over here, that's the best land, that's well watered, that's great for all my flocks. I'm going over there, Abraham. What do you think, Abraham? Is he snookered? Is he snookered himself? Because, you know, isn't the promise to Abraham and not to Lot? Well, yes, it is. So is, is Abraham just sort of made a, a mess of the whole thing? No. No, no. Abraham is showing moderation showing his sweet reasonableness. Now he's saying to Lot, that's fine, you take that. You take it, it's all yours, you have it. It's not important to me. I still know God's promised what he's promised to me. It doesn't affect that. You can't argue with that, can you? 
Don't you try and argue with that. And so Abraham sets off in the opposite direction and God taps him on the shoulder. He said, now Abraham, I want you to lift up your eyes. I want you to look north and south, east and west. In other words, in every direction of the compass. And I'm going to remind you, it is all yours. Wow. It lost nothing. Thank you, Abraham. An example of how to show moderation. Brilliant. So we don't need to insist on our rights. Christian character shows something different. And now, Paul begins to make an appeal. So, he introduces himself as a prisoner. Did you notice that? As a prisoner. Now he says, I'm an elderly man. You see what he's trying to convey here? Not I'm an apostle, I'm great, you listen to me. He's saying, no, I'm frail, I'm old. I'm actually a prisoner. I've got limited choice, if any, to do anything. You know, I've been humble, Philemon, and I'm taking that place. And out of my heart, I'm going to appeal to you. Out of that position of lowliness, I'm making an appeal to you. Wait, how, how could Philemon resist it? You remember how um, in Matthew 15, the mother came to Jesus, a Canaanite woman it describes her as, she comes to Jesus and pleads with him to heal her daughter. She's demon-possessed. And he turns to her and says, it's not right to take the food from the children and to give it to the little dogs under the table. Ooh, oh, that stings, doesn't it? Ooh. Do you think she got really upset with him? Really angry? Started to state her claim and, and get aggressive or, or use some other techniques? No. She accepts that position and says, even the little dogs take the crumbs that fall. And in that position of humility, Jesus says to her, you've got what you want. Your daughter is healed. Isn't that lovely? Humility, making that humble appeal, and the response from Jesus, how wonderful that was. He wanted to draw that out of her. And there it was. Beautiful. And then the other example I thought of is Naaman. Remember Naaman? That mighty warrior in the Old Testament, full of leprosy. And he went to the prophet to see if he could get healed, imagining all sorts of wonderful things he had to do. The prophet didn't even come out and see him. He sent his servant. How dishonoring. How humbling. Naaman got really grumpy and stormed off in his chariot thinking, I'm not going to do anything that, that that servant says. I'm well above that. And bathing in a dirty, filthy river? Come on, who does he think I am? Thankfully, he had a wise servant that came alongside and said, listen, if they told you to do something great, you would have done it. How much easier is it just to do this simple thing? And because of the wisdom of that servant, Naaman said, okay, I'll try it. And he humbled himself. And he did have to humble it. He had to get out of the chariot and get into the dirty water and do just as he said. You see, there's no room for pride in any of this. No room for pride. And so Paul appeals to Philemon. Okay. And now, what's he doing? The problem is named, the charge. I appeal to you, verse 10, for my son Onesimus. Here it is. Okay, now he's got to it. I don't know what Philemon was expecting to, um, to be in this letter. 
I wonder if he was expecting Onesimus' name to be in it. But now he has it. Ooh, what's he thinking now? What's he thinking? I appeal to you for Onesimus. But there's a change. It is my son. My son. So now he is understanding that what has happened is a radical change in the person that ran away from Philemon. He is now a true believer. He is a Christian. And uh, Brother um, Alistair shared that wonderful verse in 2 Corinthians 5.17 this morning. I'm a new creation. No more in condemnation. Here in the grace of God we stand. So a transformation has taken place in Onesimus' life. And Paul is now saying, Philemon, what happened before was a completely different set of circumstances. I'm letting you know now that Philemon, uh, Onesimus is a true believer. I wonder if Philemon was now starting to think about that prodigal son parable that Jesus taught. You remember how he had a son that went off and disgraced the family and took the wealth and dishonored that name and lost it all and brought great harm. And yet when he came back, the father was there to greet him. And he ran to meet him. And kissed him and put a ring on his finger and a robe on his shoulders. It's funny when remembering that. Jesus would say in Matthew 10, freely you have received. Freely you have received, funny man. Freely give. Isn't that wonderful? Now, <clears throat> I want to um, oh, have to deal with uh, the cost identified. He's, Paul is, is not minimizing. I'll just go back for the references for you. Apparently, I can't. Paul is not minimizing the fact that there was a cost involved. In fact, when Paul says in verse 12, about Onesimus. He says, I am sending him back to you as my own heart. There is a cost here on both sides. There has been a cost to Philemon in the initial loss. And now Paul is saying, there's actually a cost to me. Because I was receiving benefit having him here. But I have given that up so that you might have him back. So there's a cost. You can see that? Paul is acknowledging that. And it's important to acknowledge that there is cost in doing anything like this. You know? There is cost. There's always a cost to doing something that is right, that is displaying Christian character, that is dealing with stuff as it should be dealt with. There is always a cost. And I always think of Esther. Remember Queen Esther as she stood in that courtyard on behalf of God's people, wondering if she would be accepted by the king. Because if she wasn't, it was certain death. But she was prepared to make that decision, to pay that price, to accept that cost, if it was doing the right thing for God. Wonderful example. Okay. Now it is. The consent. This is really remarkable. Verse 14. I didn't want to do anything without your consent. Paul says to Philemon, the situation is, I don't want to make the call on this. I want you to have freedom to respond. That's hard. That's hard. That's hard for Paul because he's leaving it up to Philemon. And it's also hard for Philemon because he has now got to respond. 
do that. It's never easy when we have something we want to achieve to just hand it over and allow God to work in someone's heart. It's a rare and a beautiful thing when Christians can meet together and wait for each other. They may not come from the same background, the same ideas, the same upbringing, the same mindset, the same worldview necessarily, and all of that comes together in a space, and there, there is potential for great harm. But if there's humility, and if there is a place for waiting for God to move, among his people, then there can be agreement. I will do nothing without your consent, Philemon. is saying, I am waiting to see how God is moving in your heart. It's an incredible thing. And this is how hard it is, because the disciples in Luke 22 have just had that lesson from Jesus about being a servant. And what do they do? The very next conversation they have is, who is the greatest? And we're so dumb sometimes, aren't we? We just had the best lesson on being a servant you could ever experience, and we're talking about who's being the greatest? Seriously. But that's what's in the human heart, isn't it? And it's just coming out. Lord Jesus said it's not the outside stuff that defiles a person, but what's in the heart. We see it again in um, a guy called Diotrephes. In uh, 3 John, John writes about him and he says, be careful. He loves to have the preeminence. He loves the first place. You've got to be careful. That's something that you love or you recognize in somebody else, be very careful. It's not from God. Even Peter. Now, Peter is a great man, a great disciple, a great leader in those early days of the church, pioneer in spreading the message to the Gentiles, even before Paul was let loose. And yet peer pressure got to him. And he started withdrawing from the Gentiles. And Paul says in Galatians, I had to rebuke him to his face. Imagine that. In front of everybody. So even good people can make mistakes. But here's the thing. We need to allow the grace of God to come into the situation and transform I have, I have seen different responses. Some, I remember one occasion um, dealing with a situation and a person who came in with a very set idea about how they wanted to do something. And when things weren't going their way, became very aggressive. Very aggressive. Verbally, verbally abusive, and then decided to go out and start to spread all kinds of malicious things. I have also seen a situation where somebody who had been dealt with very badly in Christian situations and treated disrespectfully come in with the right to have certain things done and just simply said, I'll accept whatever you decide. You see the difference? It's in the heart. It's in the heart. We've got to allow God to work in our heart to bring Christ out. Isn't that why um, when Paul talks about transformation, I love this verse, Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. Is he living in, in us? Is he living in us? And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith 
in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And sometimes we need to stop and think, is what I'm doing from God or is it from my own desire, ambition, attitude? We need to check ourselves so that what is coming across to others is Christ in me and not me without Christ. It's tough stuff, isn't it? Really tough stuff. He says in verse 18, if Onesimus has wronged you, charge it to my account. Isn't this a beautiful example of salvation itself? Isn't it? What Paul is saying is, there may be a cost to pay. Here is somebody who can't pay it. He hasn't got the means to pay anything. He's an inexperienced Christian anyway. He, he probably doesn't know what he's supposed to do in these circumstances, but he's willing to try. But if there is a cost, I'm going to stand there and I'm, I'm going to meet that for you, Philemon. Would we be prepared to do that? Would we be prepared to get involved on behalf of somebody and make that call? Because there is a cost to doing what is right. And yet Jesus himself it says in 1 Peter 2.24, He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live by righteousness, by his wounds we have been healed. If anybody should be willing to pay a cost, it should be us because we have received a free gift of salvation. Isn't that wonderful? Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. My last point, you'll be pleased tonight. Just finish with this. Verse 21, since I am confident of your obedience. Finally, Paul wraps it up. He's made his appeal. He's laid the matter out. He's humbled himself. He identifies there is a cost. He's prepared to do whatever it takes to bridge that gap. But then he finishes by saying, Philemon, I wrote this personally because of my great confidence in you that you will respond as Christ wants you to. Isn't that wonderful? If someone was writing to you or to me, would they be able to write that? Would they be able to say those things about us? Confident that we would do what Christ would do in that situation? How amazing is that? You remember the day when Israel rejected, rejected God and wanted a king? Samuel was distraught with it, wasn't he? But God said to him, it's not you they've rejected. It's me. But Samuel responds this way. He says, God forbid that I would ever stop praying for you all. There's the true heart. Boy, these are challenging things. These are really confronting things. But isn't it good to have a bit of a blueprint? And now I must confess I've used this on occasions. Now the circumstances might differ in detail. But to have something to reference like this in how to respond when somebody has wronged you or someone close to you is a wonderful gift that God has given us. Let's go out there and by his grace try to respond in the way he wants us to. Father, thank you for the great example in Christ and for this beautiful letter which draws together some 
some incredible truths and instruction as to how we should respond to difficult situations. Father, help us not to sweep it or stamp it, but to restore it by your grace and the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask for your help in Jesus' name.